Let, let's look at 1 Peter 2.9 for our message here today. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What a passage of scripture that is. I mean, that's, wow, that's, that's in your face powerful. At least I think it is. And, and as we discuss this this morning, uh, and as I looked at all this, I began to think about there's been many, many, many studies done uh, that talk about the way you see yourself, the way you perceive yourself, determines to a large degree the way that you act and react in your life, the way you see yourself. Now, a lot of us, I know, spend a whole lot of our lives trying to understand how other people see us and act according to that. But you quickly learn that don't work because everybody sees you different and you get schizophrenia and the next thing you know, you're crazy. So you can't, you've got to, you've got to see yourself for yourself, right? Uh, and this is not a new discovery. The way you see yourself uh, affects the way you act. That's not a brand new discovery. We might think it's a new psychological uh, uh, methodology, but thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago, King Solomon wrote about it in Proverbs 23, 7. And he said that as we think in our hearts, so are we. So it's a really fundamental, important principle to understand as we live this life. The basic concept of this reality brings us to a question which I hope will help us all confront our own uh, particular destiny. Uh, and I like to say our own clearly obvious and apparent fate as God shows it to us if we'll just let him do that. And the question is, and I want to state this in a way so you don't think I'm saying it wrong, but the question is, so who do you think you are? Not so, who do you think you are? <laughs> Not that. So, you know, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? We all have this perspective. We all do. We have this perspective of ourselves that we can really only see from a biased viewpoint. And, of course, that biased viewpoint is ours. That's how we see ourselves. We think we all know. We think we do. We know all there is to know about ourselves. But we seldom, if you, if you really stop and consider... We seldom really see ourselves every day as the Lord sees us. We, we tend to see ourselves, again, from our perspective or other people's perspectives and their input into our lives. But we seldom take the time to, to really look at ourselves as God sees us. Our, our opening verse then reveals that all of these titles that were used in the Old Testament to describe God's people are now part of who we are. They belong to us as modern-day Christians. We don't necessarily use them, uh, but they belong to us. They're part of who we are. All of these titles bring with them the, the opportunity to comprehend who we are in Jesus right now in 2016. And once we comprehend or understand any of these things, even to the smallest degree, we begin to think like that in order to become that. Comprehension and awareness then gives us the, the ammunition to absorb it and begin to think about these things and then begin to come these things, become these things. Because as we think in our hearts, which is the center of our being, our mind, who we are as a person, as we think, so we are. That's what Scripture teaches us plainly. It's what God, what God teaches us. Each of these phrases in this Scripture we just read deserves a full-length message. And maybe we'll get to that. But really what we're doing today is continuing the message that was given a couple of weeks ago. Nobody is a nobody. This is really, I think, as I presented even now, it's a continuation of that. So they kind of go together. But this morning we just need to notice just a few things about ourselves as we begin to experience the specific word that we have for this morning. And, and here it is in a nutshell, you are important. You are. And that's, like I say, the continuation of what we spoke about. You cannot begin to walk in your destiny until you accept the fact that you're important. You can't. You are valuable. Uh, most of us spend our entire lives trying to earn acceptance. We don't even know we're doing it sometimes, but that's what we do. We want to earn it from our parents. I mean, that's important. From our peers, from our coworkers, uh, from our family, and on and on the list goes. We want to be accepted. 
We have spent our entire lives trying to be approved of based on, you know, other people's expectations most of the time. But we do. We want to receive validation. We want to be received as valid. All of us do. And there is no doubt we have done, the, just the people in this room, not anybody watching, just the people in this room, we've done some crazy things to be accepted. Oh, man. I mean, you think about some of the things you did. Well, you have done, even last week, I guess, for some of you. Just to be accepted. Some of the things that we do. We love that feeling. I mean, we really do. We love the feeling that reflects, I am important. I am. Someone has chosen me and somebody has accepted me. I'm not the last one or not. The, you know, I, 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 yeah, when you choose teams, you know, you always the last one. I was the first one. You know, we love that feeling. I am important. I am accepted. We all love that. And really, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself in the right context. But think about what we heard a moment ago in opening scripture. You, and, that, and, and it's turned to you as you read it. You are a chosen race, God's own purchased special people. So you've been chosen. You have been chosen first. You have been chosen by God himself. Jesus the Christ has accepted you, and you have by faith accepted his choice. And there are no other conditions listed in Scripture uh, that, that go along. It's not based on your performance. We know that. It's, it, it's not something that, that you have earned or you could possibly ever earn. You, you, have, you have never and you will never, ever deserve it. Ever. Ever. You, <laughs> you have been chosen. The Lord Jesus has simply said, I choose you. Now that applies to everybody, but not everybody accepts it. But if you'll accept it, it's as individual as it possibly can be and as corporate as it possibly can be. But Jesus has said, I choose you. How valuable is that? That's awesome. Not only are you important, but you are worth something. And of course, then the question comes up, how much do you think you're worth? And we go back to that original. Who do you think you are? How much are you really worth? I'm not talking about net financial worth. I'm talking about your worth as a child of the Most High King. Do not, do not ever confuse your valuables with your value as a son or daughter of God. Don't do it. Don't do it. No matter how many times you hear it on the radio or watch it on TV, you can be rich, you can be poor, you can be somewhere in between, but please listen, it has absolutely nothing to do with the measure of your value in the kingdom of God. Go. Nothing. I'm so, I have to... Wow, I'm so tired of hearing this on the radio. I listen to the radio a lot because I drive a lot. And I'm so tired of hearing all, how people value things by material worth in the kingdom of God. It's distorted. It, it's crazy. Uh, there are other words I could use, but, but listen very carefully. There are two basic things then that we use as human beings, especially in America, uh, to determine value on this planet Earth. And so it's worth discussing so that we can maybe get a better idea of who we are and, and, and what we really do have. Two things. Number one, what is somebody willing to pay for something? Okay, we know that determines value. And number two, who has owned it in the past? Uh, you know, if a famous person has owned a pencil, it's a whole lot. It's worth a whole lot more than if just a regular person. And in our in our viewpoint, how we estimate value, that's how we do it. Well, based on these two things, then what is your, your value? And, and you can ask yourself this morning, who owns me? What price has been paid for me? You have been bought and you have been paid for by Jesus Christ. You belong to God. How much are you worth? Jesus paid for you with his own blood, with his own life. He bought you back from the devil, and God exchanged his son for you. The redemption has taken place. The cross proves your value. God says, I love you so much that I came in the flesh to prove it to you and gave life to prove it to you. So that means I've got to tell you that you must be, you must be mighty valuable. 
You must be very, very important. You must be. Uh, you must be extremely important for God to come in the flesh to prove it to you. You must be. So who am I or who is anybody else to state otherwise or even think otherwise? You are so useful as, as a child of God now, as a born-again believer, you are so useful now that God actually calls you a royal priesthood. Seriously. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. We've taken that and twisted that and, and made it represent something it doesn't represent. You are a royal priesthood. Why is that even written, though, Pastor Jerry? What? Priesthood? Why is that written? In the Old Testament, everything the priests did, and I think we're teaching the kids this now in, in Sunday school. Uh, that's what the kids are learning about now. Uh, but everything the priests did culminated pretty much in two, two basic things. There are a whole lot of things they did, but there are two things that everything culminated in. The, first of all, they had the right and they had the privilege, uh, as well as the responsibility, to go directly to God. The, there was the only ones who could do that. They could go directly to God. They could pray to God, talk to God, listen to God, worship him, and fellowship with him. Everybody else had to go through the priest. The second thing, second, the priest had the privilege and, the, and also the responsibility of representing what they just did, going to God, back to the people, and ministering and serving the people now. They could go to God, and they could serve the people, the needs of everybody else. These are the two basic things that a priesthood would culminate in. These are the very two things that are true of you now as born-again believers in Jesus Christ. When you become a believer, you now have the right to go directly into the throne room, to go directly to your Father, directly to the throne of grace, and commune with God. You do. You do. You don't go through anybody. Jesus Christ is now the only mediator. You have been gifted then to do that, but then you also turn right around and you've been gifted to serve others in ministry. Every born-again believer is a minister. Every born-again believer is a priest. I know you've never thought of yourself as that. Uh, you, you don't go around, you know, I wear these banded collars all the time, and some people confuse that for other things. But the only reason I do that is because I hate ties. And these are great, man. You, you know, there's nowhere to put a tie. And everybody thinks you're still dressed up, and so it's cool. You don't have to worry about it. But everybody, you know, are you Episcopal? Are you Catholic? Uh, no, I'm, you know, German. German Irish. <laughs> this is what you get when you mix the two together. We're too drunk to be mad. No, that's not. I do say those things, but. <laughs> so, you know, you've never, probably never thought of yourself as a priest, you know? And so, wait a minute. Wow. Wow. Well, this changes the whole picture then. Every born-again believer, anytime you're using your talents and your gifts, remember we talked about that two weeks ago, don't use the list in the Bible as an exhaustive list. It's not. There are so many talents and gifts, we can't make a list of them. They're just as individual as you are. Some of the things that you do, you don't realize how gifted you are because you just do them naturally, and everybody else looks at you in wonder, and they think, how could he do that? Well, he's gifted to do that, or she's gifted to do that. So don't think of the list in the Bible is being exhausted. They are not. Anytime you use your gifts and your talents, whatever they may be, anytime you're using your talents and gifts to help others, you are ministering. You are in ministry. If you're fixing a gate for someone, for maybe an elderly person who can't do that for themselves, and you're fixing so their gate can open and close, you just went into ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So don't ever put it in a box and think about it being anything other than what it is. You, because you're a priest, you can go directly to God, and then you're supposed to turn right around and minister or serve other people. And that, that's what our destiny is. And I hope we realize that. Why, you know, why didn't God just save you and then go ahead and take you on to heaven? Okay, you're ready now. Let's go. We're done. We don't have to worry about any, anything else. Just save you and take you on to heaven because you are saved to serve him by serving others. 
That's why you're saved. Some people do get saved and go directly to heaven. I see that probably once a week now. But I'm telling you, you are saved to serve. A non-serving Christian is a contradiction. You can claim to be following Christ all you want, but if you're not serving other people, you're not following Christ. Because that's what he does. That's what he did. We're supposed to, he said, you know, do what I do. Do what I did. But non-service is total incompatibility. It, it really, and as harsh as this may sound, uh, I think it's true. It's hypocrisy epitomized. If you don't serve, uh, it's hypocrisy. God saved all of us for his purposes of service. And it is in those purposes that we fulfill our destiny, whatever that may be. You may, you may be dead. Well, we can go off on that. I don't want to do that because I'll get distracted. You know, a squirrel. Going back to the point, you're important. You're important. Don't ever think you're not important. Whatever it is your talents or gifts may be, you are useful. And here's why. I mean, we could, we could you know, think of ourselves and get puffed up and proud, but here's why you're useful. You are important and useful because you are forgivable. That's why. That's, that's exactly why. 1 John 1, 8 through 10, and, and chapter 2, is one, verses 1 and 2. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving everybody else. No, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world, for those of the whole world. See, we've all been chosen, not all of us accepted. You are forgivable. And I hope that that battle has been won, but I know it hasn't. I, I hope for that. See, hope that you have is not hope. So I hope that you grab a hold of this because some of you here this morning, some of you watching this are genuinely battling the fact, the scriptural fact, that you're forgivable. Actually, that you're even forgiven. God is not holding a grudge against you. He's not mad at you. So why do you hold one against yourself? Why do you hold on to things that God is not holding on to? He has forgiven you, and, and the key to understanding God's forgiveness is two processes. He has forgiven you, and he has forgotten what you've done. That's how it works with God. I know it doesn't work with us that way. God wants it to work with us. You know, we always pray at night, God, God, forgive us our sins and help us forgive others as you forgive us. I mean, we pray that every night because God forgives and forgets. As it's written in Psalm 103, 11 through 12. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great are his mercy and loving kindness toward those who reverently and worshipfully fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Oh, man. Jeremiah 31, 34. For I, this is God talking. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will seriously. I love that. You know when we say that? Seriously. I will seriously remember their sin no more. Man, Southern California, I guess. Hebrews 8, 12, For I will be merciful and gracious uh, toward their sins, and I will remember their deeds of unrighteousness no more. Isaiah 43, 25, God talking again, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Praise his holy name. So don't, you don't have to battle that battle because it's not yours to fight. It's a non-existent battle. God forgives and forgets. You have been made holy in the eyes of God. And I know that's hard to grasp. I know it is. You, have, you are here before the Lord this morning holy and clean and pure. And that's how God sees you. That's his viewpoint of you. His righteousness makes it so, not ours. His righteousness, his sacrifice, his holiness, his purity, his blood has washed you, and nothing can change that. 
I'm convinced of that scripturally. Nothing. Uh, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfection of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're important. You're important, valuable. You're useful because you're forgivable. And you are forgiven. There's no excuse for any of us not to fulfill our supernatural fate because the one who designed our fate will accomplish it through us if we will just let him. If we'll just let him do that. God has equipped all of us for all that he has called us to be and become. Maybe then it's time to act like that. So what do we have to fear? What, if we will take, take this and use it, God has called me. He has set up my destiny, my fate. He has called me to come to him directly and to serve him by serving others. What have I got to be afraid of then? What could possibly happen? What can, how scripture go? What can man do to me? Who do you think you are? It's who I think I am. So there's no excuse. Our step of faith today is then directed by Isaiah 40, 31. This is our step of faith. There's always an action. God always wants us to take action to respond or react to his grace and mercy. And the, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. You shall lift your wings and mount up as eagles close to God. And if you'll think about eagles just for a minute, we've talked about this years ago, uh, but think about the, the bald eagle just for a minute. One of the uh, fascinating things about the eagle, and that's why this is even brought up in Scripture, is how it trains its young to become a graceful bird, how it trains its young to mature. These eagles are, are amazing, especially bald eagles. They have talons, you know, their feet, their claws. Uh, they can grow up to 15 inches long, which is like, whoa. No wonder they can pick things up, you know. But 15 inches long, and, and they build these nests for their little, their young. And when they hatch, they use their own down. And uh, mom brings feathers and all these soft things into this rough-hewn nest. Everything's real soft and warm and cozy and real comfortable for the baby chicks. And moms, they're taking care of them and, and, and doing everything that they need. And, and they are comfortable. We know about that. We call that our comfort zone. They're very, very comfortable. Now, when these young chicks first get old enough to fly on their own, then mom does something unusual to encourage her chicks to leave the nest. She takes those big talons of hers and she starts messing up the nest. So she's take out some of the comfortable stuff. And so it's getting a little uncomfortable in here. Oh, I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about and where this is going, but we got to go there. It starts getting uncomfortable, you know, and that's what she does. And she changes the comfort zone just, just slightly, but she changes it. And here we go. Everybody's fine. There's no risks. Everybody's in their comfort zone. Everything's cool. Why are things changing now? I haven't done anything. I'm just here. I've been here this whole time. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm a baby chick. Here I am. Well, she takes, starts taking the chicks out on training flights. She actually puts them on her back, which this is just so cool. Puts them on her back and flies. She'll take some flight. Not very long, but she'll fly long enough, take them back, put them in the nest. Then she'll next day she'll messes up the nest a little bit more. Oh man, this is there's no more down in here. It's really getting uncomfortable now. Takes them out, brings them back to the nest, and then one day, one day, mom decides it's time for these chicks to find out their destiny is not to live in this nest. Their destiny is to fly. They're to live in the sky, pretty much. That's their destiny. And she decides, you know, and you would think that, that all these efforts would be understood, but you know how that goes. You know how that goes. We, you know, God tries to convince us of things. You think we'd start understanding. There's a reason that where you think you're supposed to be is getting uncomfortable. 
You're getting poked by a thorn or, you know, a stick and the down is gone. The feathers are gone. All, everything you thought was comfortable and where you're supposed to be the rest of your life, it's not that way anymore. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. So what happens then? Uh, Mom finally says, you know, I'm tired of all this coddling and all this nurturing. Something's got to change. So now I'm going to take these 15-inch talons and I'm destroying the whole nest. The whole comfort zone is gone. I'm getting rid of all of it. What happens now? She puts the chicks on her back. She takes flight. Now it's time for solo flight. She dips, drops them. And you know when you get dropped, you're either going to fly or fall. I mean, it's, most actually, most of the chicks, they, they get it, and they start flying, you know. But there's a few that they'll, I mean, they're plumbing into the ground, or they'll be plumbing towards the side of a mountain or whatever, and she will, and the scientists have documented that, she will zoom down and catch them just in, on her back and zoom back up, and she goes higher. She goes higher than what she did before, up into the thermal air even. She goes higher and drops them again. It's time to fly. Now, now, there is no nest anymore. There's no going back because it doesn't exist anymore. It's all been to all the comfort zone, all the things that you thought were life, that's gone. It's time. You're either going to fly or die. You know you've been there. Some of you are there right now. So she takes them up. Finally, after they've documented 40 or 50 times that mom has to do this with some of these chicks. 40 or 50 times she drops them and has to catch them and take them back up just a little bit higher. For you think after a while she'd say, I'm, you know, fall. I'm done with that. You know, it's a good thing she doesn't, but it, this is the same process, the same. That's why scripture brings it up, I think, part of the reason uh, that we go through with God when it comes to our destiny. Many of us have tried to understand our calling. God, what is it you want me to do? And, and we find ourselves in this tailspin, headed down. We're, we're headed down to hit the ground, or we're going to fall right into the side of a mountain. We're in a tailspin, and some of us are there right now, and I'm just here this morning to tell you, now's not the time to give up. God's not going to let you hit the ground. He's not going to let you hit the mountainside. He just wants you to take, mount up with your wings as an eagle, fulfill your destiny, and fly. Amen. And I know that's hard, of us, you know, hard for a lot of us to get. We don't want to leave the nest. That's, well, that's so comfortable, you know. Well, if you think about your life and what's transpired and brought you up to this point, it's not like you have a choice in the matter. See, what we do, God will take his talons, the word of God. He'll start messing up our nest. And what do we do? We go, we go try to get sticks to build the nest back again. We go try to find something soft, you know, to build it back up again. God's just, God's going to bust it up. That's what he does. What you have become uh, in life up to now, what you have become is not necessarily who you are. You, God prepares you. He gets you ready. It's time to leave the nest and to leave your comfort zone. God Almighty has been breaking up what you thought was cozy, safe, and comfortable. Now, who could say amen knows that's the truth? That's what he does. That's what God does. That's the only way for you to, to fly, to figure out. You are meant to fly. The very power of God tears apart what everybody's used to. The soft, the no risk, uh, you know, the perceived secure and warm things that we have in our life, the nest we refuse to leave. Uh, but our destiny cannot be fulfilled until we leave that. What God has busted up until we leave that and realize our destiny is to fly to be in the sky, flying supernaturally. Well, something has to change. And that's what God does. That's really what he does. The nest is gone. You've got a new home base, and your new home base is the sky. And God calls each and every one of us to mount up our wings, mount up closer to God than you ever have before. And the only way you can do that, the only way you can do that is to fly. Walking doesn't work. You can only get so high, but when you fly closer 
and closer. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, Faithful is he who is calling you to himself and utterly trustworthy, and he will also do it. Fulfill his call by hallowing and keeping you. Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit has a process for us outside of all our traditions outside of all our comfort zones, a process that he wants to take us through, which will take us to where the Lord is calling us if we'll just allow it to happen, whatever that may be. The spiritual events that have taken place in your life are not sequences of coincidence. They are not. They are preparation. They are certain specific events in your life and challenges that are part of God's precise plan for your life if you just let it be that way, if you will allow it. Now, I know, uh, I think my time's up. That's my uh, timer. No. (laughs) Now, I know this is hard to understand intellectually. I realize that. Object, even subjectively, but objective. I realize this is hard to grab a hold of sometimes. But a, a whole lot of things in life are not understandable, but we take them anyway. You do have a destiny, and it's time for you to fly. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. I am God, and there is no one else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end and the result from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure and purpose. God will. There is a higher purpose for your life. There is. And being born again from above is just the beginning of it. It's time to take hold of it and to eagerly grasp, eagerly to make it your own, to capture and gain possession of the fact it's time to take part in the plan that the Lord has for you. And he's prepared you for it this whole time. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a dedicated nation. You are God's own purchased special people. Lift up your wings and mount up close to God as eagles. It's time to fly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Musicians, if you come back. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, which he planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. A greater destiny which you have. Time to fly. Amen. Amen. Amen.